Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sven Cattell. I have been uh, uh, running the AI Village. Sorry, uh, I'll step a little closer. Uh, hi, I'm Sven Cattell. Uh, I've been running the AI Village at DEF CON for the last eight years, uh, kind of. Uh, it was basically eight years ago that I actually texted a few people. There's a couple people in the room and saying, hey, do you want to meet up for coffee? Uh, and then pitch running, making the AI Village. And then the following year, we had our first one in 2018. Um, and it's been a bit of a ride learning about how AI security works uh, because I was a mathematician at Johns Hopkins um, doing a postdoc in geometric machine learning. And then suddenly I was helping run a AI conference at DEF CON. Uh, and because of that, I got to know a lot of people in the industry who have actually dealt with this stuff. And it's um, so I had some love, interesting conversations. Um, so I, uh, as you can see from the ta tagline, there's the LLM craze, which I helped contribute to with some of the things we did in the Generative Red team last year with the White House and a bunch of the vendors. Um, and a bunch of snake oil salesmen in AI uh, trying to sell you things that don't really help much. Um, and I, this is, some of this has pissed me off. And I've given rants about this to people. And now, unfortunately, the rants have gotten away from me and I'm here. Uh, so um, to start with, uh, the first reported vulnerability in a production machine learning model uh, that I, I, is from 2004. Uh, there is older versions of this from 2003, um, but those were Usenet posts, uh, posts just emailed to each other, and I've lost those uh, to the ether. The bookmark exists on my computer, so I wasn't imagining things, but it, the, it now 404s. And what it was was Bayesian poisoning, which is one of the it's the oldest thing. If you ever get into uh, machine learning security, this is one of the things that they teach you uh, the first things. And what it is is you append a bunch of hammy words to the end of your spam. Uh, so you, if you want to send that link, that uh, sending a single link inside of an email is a bit spammy. But then if you add a bunch of words and, and put it maybe put it in white text so they can't see it. Um, the fil e old email filters would just let you through. And this is um, still effective against some machine learning models, as you can see, we'll see. Um, but this was like the first one where like, oh god, we got popped, the machine learning model has a vulnerability, and this is kind of unpatchable. Uh, you had to do something else. And the, uh, this ca the, the actual documentation from this came from John Cumming Grams, uh, he's now the CTO of Cloudflare's, uh, presentation on this, and he had a bunch of other uh, bypasses in that presentation. I think there were like six total different ways that people had come up with in the last year to get past their, his machine learning model. And this is one of the kind of rules that you have to learn with AI security. There are always other bypasses, and machine learning is just not secure. Like you, sh it, it you need to shift your mindset of how you think about AI security when you want when you come to machine learning. So the, the main thing is models make mistakes. So uh, if you have a model that is 100% accurate, something went wrong. Um, uh, mal production malware models are 99.99% accurate. Four, ac four nines, maybe five or six nine per, uh, percent uh, accurate. And still, the mistakes they made come back and bite you in the ass sometimes. There's no way around the fact that they just make mistakes, and each mistake could cost one of your customers a lot of money if, for malware or spam models. It's just like thing. But we build our ecosystem around the fact that these models are just there to like stem the tide, not make the make. Are, they aren't the critical component. They just help a lot. So. And the thing is, attackers, they just exploit the errors. If they find a way to get past your machine learning models, they're just going to do that same O thing over and over again. And like, there's no way for you to prevent them. To, because if you never make a mistake, you're not doing machine learning. This isn't cryptography. And then the other big thing that you have to know for AI systems is um, they don't do well on outer distribution data. And the classic example from this for, from academia is you take MNIST, which is uh, the digits of the postcards, uh, and you train a model, there's 50,000 images in the MNIST data set, uh, training data set that people use. Um, 
and you train a model on that, and then suddenly you start feeding it things from Fashion Amnest, which are the correct format to feed this model, but you don't expect this model to handle this stuff well, and it can do all sorts of funky stuff. Um, the theory that some people have with like PE data is if you collect enough PE data and you train a model well enough, it'll generalize to the new stuff. And people, if you went to the RSA floor and the, uh, or Black Hat and people were talking about the AI and their thing, the next gen AI back in 2018 and 2019, when that was really exploding, uh, ex exploding, they're like, oh yeah, our AI generalizes to the new threat so we can keep you secure against new things. That mostly works. Um, but one of the problems is AI doesn't actually generalize that well. Every single time that I've, a new model comes up and everyone's like, oh, it's so creative and can do things, we find out that it's actually repeat, like a remix of things that it's already done. Remixing stuff is very helpful. There are a lot of, um, like a lot of academic work and music work is done with remixes. But like when you actually get new things in the system, which happens all the time with uh, PE data, um, with malware other things, especially with malicious stuff, it, remixing doesn't get you there. And one of the things that you find out and we know from security is attackers do weird things all the time to get past your bypasses. So you're always going to get out of distribution data. You're always going to get, uh, you're always going to make mistakes. So I can't. To get this, to, to like make a comparison to drive it home, imagine if you have a, uh, a single API, really simple API. Uh, it just like takes in some bytes and returns some bytes, just can't like, you know, something that you can implement in like under 5,000 lines of C with no Nginx, no Apache, just like a nice, like simple, like you take the packets out of the kernel and reply. Very, the simplest thing you can actually get work, maybe get working. Um, you could get get a competent a competent engineer could get to this point where you put it in a box, ignore it in the corner, and you can pretty you're pretty certain that it's not going that box isn't going to get popped. But this is like you know a constrained like thing. That's what some people will pitch you on AI. Like and you people have gotten some secure systems. When have you heard about like the actual financial transaction parts of a bank getting popped? That doesn't really happen anymore. There was major changes in the eighties and regulations and and those are handled on mainframe. Things around the banks get popped, but the actual financial transactions are much are handled well. But now if you think about securing an enterprise with tens of thousands of endpoints and no idea of what they own, no idea what the things, users clicking stuff all the time. Um, you, you, you don't, that's, that security thing is not the same as the first one. You're not trying to secure one system. You are assuming that a user will screw up and you're going to get popped. And you want a good EDR, a good enterprise detection response thing, system, a nice a SOC in there. You want people to come, uh, uh, incident remediation. You focus, you, you drive less of your resources towards securing your environment and making sure that the, there's a wall between you and the world and more resources towards making sure that when something happens, you have a good response time and the damage is minimized. And you should think about AI as the second one and not the first one, and it's even worse than that. Because defending machine learning models is even worse than defending against, uh, you know, defending a large enterprise with unknown unknowns and people doing shadow IT and a bunch of other stuff. Um, this is one of my favorite examples of this. Uh, this is a two-dimensional slice of 780-dimensional space. And each color is sort of a unique decision made by a neural network. And now this, this is a two-dimensional slice. There are, for this very simple neural network, there are two to the 60 regions in here. Very simple neural network because it had 60 hidden layer, hidden nodes. That means it had a very small amount of parameters. And now we're talking about ChatGPT with trillions of parameters. This thing had thousands of parameters. And each of those things is a unique decision. And we know from um, studying these, th studying machine learning models, that pretty much, if you're in one decision, one region here, and you change that region over there, the model's decision could change, 
and you don't know that it's going to be correct. There's this thing called adversarial examples, and this to me is like uh, uh, the, a good representation of like why you kind of be, want, should be concerned about the like, think about that. So you don't know what's going on in e most of these things. You have two to the sixty um, regions. You've only sampled and know about how your performance are in 60,000 of those regions, and you know that two to the 60 is much bigger than 60,000, so you can't control all those things that you haven't seen. So the first thing that you should always do is assume that someone's gonna pop your model. No matter what you do, there's nothing you can do to stop it, and all you can do is delay the pop, hope you see it when it happens, and fix it as quickly as possible. That is AI security in a nutshell is it is just delay it so you have to deal with it less but when it happens respond hopefully you see it and respond as quickly as possible that's it there's not really defending the model i'm going to put robust security as a big firewall and things like that the a lot of the ai firewalls don't buy you time and that's all you care about is will this buy me time if you are int introducing new systems, it will, your questions are, will this buy me time and if I or will this let me respond faster? Those are the two questions you ask and answer when, with AI systems. But now, for the, this is more of a slide for a bunch of the people who know what I'm talking about. What about my defense? Um, it's adversarial training. Um, people will bring up adversarial training if it doesn't really help um, for malware models, we found that it, uh, I, I found that it seems to hurt the model more than it harms. It didn't buy me time, and it didn't help. Um, adversarial detectors uh, very easy to build an adversarial detector that's overtrained on like IBM Art, and my attackers aren't going to do this. Uh, adversarial layers, the thing. If you want to have a better understanding of how AI defenses work in reality, go see all of the work of Nicholas Carolini. He has a lovely man who loves um, finding poor academics who come up with a an AI defense that they're very proud of and then just like wrecking their shit. Um, he, that's his favorite thing to do and he's very good at it. And so far he's like, um, you know, won every match he's every, like defeated every defense he's put his mind to. So what have we done? How do we actually manage AI risk? One, uh, this is the quote from one of the founders of the uh, Facebook site integrity team. We measure ourselves on the speed we could detect and respond to new types of attacks and mitigate the potential damage caused. Facebook knows this case. Facebook spammers always find a mistake in the spam detection service and ruthlessly exploit it uh, until it's patched. So that's their response from 20, 2007. Uh, malware, I for, this was one of those graphs where I was forecasting how bad our things are. And if you look at, I don't need to explain the graph, but the graph basically says we get popped in about three months. We deployed this, this model was deployed on January 1st, 2019. And about three months later, we know that there's a bypass because the, the blue line went up. Um, and so we would forecast it like that. So how, some historic strategy. So like it's all is not lost. People have been doing this for 20 years, and they've come up with some ways of dealing with it. So the first one is robust features. Not robust models, but robust features. And what I mean by that is you don't let the model see things that the user can control. Uh, so features that are hard for the users to control, if you are used to things about L, if you want to know a different word that people use for uh, this, this thing, uh, embeddings are the new word, um, which is mathematically correctish, but I'm used to calling them features. Um, and for spam, it's basically use the behavior of the spammer. Um, for, uh, for malware, use features that change the execution behavior. And basically, malware is very. This is very hard to do correctly. And LLMs, you want to use API key behavior. Uh, so when you register for an API, uh, for a session, uh, an, an API key with OpenAI, they're monitoring how you use it, and they will look for abuse in not not just the content, but actually what you're doing. So I want to give you an example of like how to screw this up very badly. Um, uh, silence, I kill you. 
So remember the example of the very first patch, uh, the very first vulnerability that was disclosed in 2004? Well, this is from 2019. Um, so what they did was they created a PE classifier that's trying to decide whether your PE portable executable that you've just downloaded from the internet is malicious or not. Uh, so you take your PE file, look at the header data, do a static analysis, and then you grab about 7,000, Cyanance grabbed about 7,000 features out of that and created a embedding, like a feature that they're going to use. Then they feed it to a model that has been trained on hundreds of millions of sam PE samples, about 50-50 malicious, 50-50% 50, uh, 50, uh, malicious, 50% benign, and then they train it to say good or bad. And if it says bad, it won't let the thing execute. But they had a problem. Um, Rocket League and Fortnite um, would do shady stuff on your computer. Uh, they do all sorts of kernel exploits to make sure you're not cheating in Fortnite and Epic Games is, uh, does all sorts of like kernel shenanigans to make sure that the DRM works and the cheating is not happening. So their thing was gra doing had a lot of false positives on Fortnite and Rocket League. So what they needed to do was have a way of allow listing all of uh, Rocket League's binaries. But Rocket League patches their stuff every so often, and Silence didn't want to keep updating their their allow list for each version of Rocket League because what would happen is a new version would come out, all their customers' things would, all the Rocket Leagues and so, uh, would uh, customers of theirs would complain. They would add it to the ban thing, and they would just keep going. So uh, to make this work out they put a, use these thing called centroids. So these features are a point in space, and they took that point in space, and they put a sphere around it, and they said, every single time I have a new piece of malware, if it has the same embedding, it, if its embedding ends up within the sphere, let it run, which seems like a good idea. Okay, okay this is, I'm gonna put a little tight ball, and if I have the right static analysis, I'm gonna have I'm going to only allow things that are Rocket League-like to run, except they have string data in there. And the string data was packable with, well, you can just pack whatever you want in the string data. So what they did was they took, uh, what Sci Skylight Cyber did was they took the strings from Rocket League, appended it to some malware just in the string data section, and then gave it to uh, Silence. And Silence were like, cool, this is Rocket League, I'm going to let it run. And so you could get any piece of malware, just append a bunch of strings to the end of the executable, and then get it, and it would, uh, from Rocket League, and it would, Silence uh, would let it run, which is not good. Uh, so what good features are, are hard to modify. The strings don't affect execution. So if you are really good, if you are good at your featureization, you wouldn't, you shouldn't use them because it's too easy for the users to modify. But what you do to get things that are uh, good features uh, for spam, IP address behavior, there are IPs that are just blocked from, Gmail will never get a, receive an email from that IP address because it just sends too much spam. That's a huge part of how they deal with spam. Now they're even making you, uh, in 2024, 2023, they're making you pre-register all your bulk emails to Gmail to make sure that you can't send spam. They are locking that down, making sure you're behaviorally locked down so you can't do it. Um, so domain behavior, uh, these are like these are more key indicators of spam on social media sites like Quora. Like, um, there's a long list of them, and I'm not going to get into them. Malware, the very fact that it has to execute constrains your system. You can't just do a weird, you, you have to make something that is able to execute on the end user. That hel helps constrain the people, um, uh, but one of the things is you can just pack your binary and then you'll get past it, get past the crappy detectors. Um, dynamic behavior is really what you want to do, but it's really hard to do, and I can talk about that some other time. LLMs count API behavior. If you keep asking it for like violent, malicious, violent things that uh, OpenAI doesn't want you to do it, they're going to say, okay, cool, he's asked for a violent thing. That's normal. Users t users usually ask for a violent thing once a week. That I can f I'm fine with that. But if you ask for violent things repeatedly over and over and over again, you get a warning saying, "Don't put give. I don't want to do this." But that's how OpenAI deals with it. 
Next thing for AI security, you know, since you know you're going to get popped, you don't want to talk about it. Um, obscurity is security here. So not telling your users how it works means they don't know what they're doing when they're trying to mess with you. So it takes them longer to get past. Um, so you just don't want to say anything. An example of a bad example, uh, proof pudding. So proof point used to reply with all that data whenever you got a, whenever it got an email. And so it, that data is basically the outputs of your machine learning model. And it would just give it to you. And now uh, Will Pierce and Nick Glanders use these to steal the model weights. And now they could do all sorts of fun stuff with this because they stole it because Proofpoint gave them way too much information. Um, and if you steal the model in the right way, you can now like go make your own custom emails on your home computer, make sure that it gets past Proofpoint, and then start sending those without letting Proofpoint know that you're making nice emails that can get past them. Um, so the Proofpoint removed those from the response. They weren't needed. Nobody cared about them except for people trying to mess with Proofpoint, so they didn't need to be there. Good obscurity. Uh, this comes from a, a social media uh, website that is not, uh, you know, not the biggest one in the world. But uh, this is how they handled spam on social media website. They had a bunch of their data, user data, in a data set, uh, and then they had a bunch of small featureizers. So one of those featureizers will be like, "Hey, where is this IP address from? Which country it's from? All that stuff." Another featureizer will be like, "How often these people log in?" all sorts of different featureizers. They had way too many of them, and if they trained a model on all of them, it would be a very good model. But they don't want to make the best model, like the best model for the next week. They want to, make the, they want to maintain the service. So what they did, they, they selected a random subset of 50% of those features, just 50%, and they trained a model on just those features so that the model couldn't see all possible data that they use, all the possible signals of how malicious users use uh, their website. Um, and because they could only see a, the models could each, each model could only see a random subset that was different, each spam model behaved very differently from the previous one or the next one. So that the spammers who were now like frantically trying to spam this thing and trying to get past it had to relearn a new model every week. Um, one of the best AI hacker, like best AI hacking groups, like in the world, is just the social media. Uh, sorry, uh, the search engine optimization people, and they just get to know Google's search engine, and the YouTubers get to know the algorithm, and the these the the, the people trying to spam this website got to know the spam algorithm. So they to prevent them from learning that, they made the spam algorithm week to week change its behavior quite significantly. Still good performance, less than, but the performance each week was less than the best that they could ever get. But because it changed week to week, the spammers were constantly having to learn new things on their toes and couldn't get really get their footing, so the overall spam was lower. So that just uh, keeping things obscure and hard to learn, very, very useful. And that's part of why people don't know about a lot of these, like the stuff that I'm, uh, the history of the stuff is because one of the principles is don't talk about it. Last one, um, speed is security. Well, this is the penultimate. Speed is security. As you know, in, if you got an instant response, you, I'm sure many of you have dealt with instant response. Speed is security on instant response. But for AI systems, like uh, you do a few things. So initial response to a new attack, block list. You just need your fragile block list. Um, the silence example, if it was just a temporary block list thing that they could run for like three days while they fixed the problem and redeployed a new model, that would have been great. But because they used it perpetually, not a good idea. Uh, but block lists, all sorts of different ways to do block lists. Um, doesn't have to be robust. Doesn't have to last a long time. Just needs to get you up past the thing. Uh, this layered security principle of different types of block lists, different types of models, you can redeploy, like if you, if you have SOFA stuff, if you, you can redeploy your spam model to prevent uh, hackers from getting stuff over. If there's a new strategy that's uh, people are, a uh, new phishing strategy that people are doing, and you don't, you're training, retraining your malware model uh, for you know, a new phishing strategy with a ransomware in there. Retraining your malware model is probably more expensive than retraining your spam model. 
retraining and redeploying spam models are fair, faster, put quick block on the thing, and then like different types of models and things that you can do to be faster is more important. But layered security allows you to be fast. Um, retraining time, uh, do your stuff best to make this as short as possible. If you've got a week to retrain your malware mo or your spam model, then uh, you're, you're screwed. You have to redeploy that every three days. Um, so you've got to get that faster. Uh, and now the last one that's really hard uh, is detecting a breach. One of the problems with AI systems is you have thousands. Uh, if you are doing, uh, if you are CrowdStrike, you have billions of PE, new, uh, of PE queries a day. And a new strain of new, new strain of malware could be hiding in those billions. And there's not, there's not going to be that many of them. And one of your customers could get really screwed up by that. And so how do you find that new strain out of the billions? It's not like a single sock is only seeing a small fraction of that and might be able to handle seeing a new thing and like alerts of like, hey, there's this thing going on. But once you're at CrowdStrike's level where they actually have to maintain that model, they, it's, it's much more difficult for them to find the needle in the haystack. Um, there are ways to do this, and industry is uh, the uh, advanced players in the industry are well advanced, well ahead of academia, government, anywhere else. Um, like, I interviewed with Facebook in 2018, and then I saw people describing canary systems that they were using in 2018 in papers from 2022. It took the, the academia and like the outside world was four years behind what Facebook was already using, and they spend way more on the detection response, the detection side of the detection response for machine learning models, because the response is just retrain, redeploy, patch. Very easy to automate that side. The detection is very difficult, and so they spent way more on detection than anything else. The last one is learn from your attackers. Um, don't do random shit to defend against threat models that don't exist. Um, search engine optimization people, they are attackers, they have conferences, they read weird papers and have theories and you can talk to them and you can see how they work and if you understand how they work, they would see how a lot of the threat models for how AI, the major companies for AI risk management actually work. And they, but the main thing is they try stuff until it works and then they teach and sell it to each other. Spammers do that, Facebook spammers do that too, but try stuff until it works and so they sell it to each other. Now, here's one of your favorite examples. If you see a lot of these snake oil salesmen, they'll sell you, we've got a, we've got a way to prevent adversarial examples from affecting your model. Cool, A, I don't believe you, and B, uh, if you, have you ever seen an adversarial example trying to attack your model? There are t delicate, tricky maths to get working. They don't really work for spam and malware and tabular data like that. Like a lot of security data, they don't really work for because reasons. But there's there's more there's some stuff thing. You need a very good understanding of machine learning, and which is expensive. Or you could do the wisdom of the crowd, where it's cheap. You're already doing it. You already have thousands of people writing spam and malware doing this. Uh, it goes out of distribution and it's cheap. So if you had if you were a, a if you were writing uh, trying to attack a machine learning model, which would you choose? Uh, so this is part of the reason why we don't uh, adversarial examples. We see people doing weird stuff like uh, if after Ember 2018 was released and people found out malware uh, was sensitive to imports, uh, uh, people writing malware would start shoving random imports into their malicious software, which was not a normal thing before that release. Before people figured out machine learning models were sensitive to that. But that's because they learned it and they just started trying it to see if it worked, not like that they actually did something adversarial. Now, model poisoning is another thing that people come up with. You can inject a very small amount of data into a model data set and it can drastically affect that model's behavior at a target point. So if you want a, your model to misclassify something that is malicious as benign, you can pre-prepare the area by putting a bunch of benign dot binaries in there that are uh, benign uh, that have the same static analysis as your malware. You just keep, do that, upload benign data for a few year for a year, prepare the area, and now you've then when you release the malicious thing, 
it can really screw with all your, those models because they're not going to detect it. Uh, how are they actually doing that? Why? Like, are they going to spend that much effort to make sure that, like, it's it's very difficult. Um, people will talk about this for LLMs, um, but like, what's the point? Um, uh, dilution is the solution to pollution. Uh, you when you have torrents of data like uh, Fire Shuttle and like uh, a lot of the stuff going into LLMs these days, just there the aggressive deduplication and handling of data that way mostly cleans up your poisoning. So it's really delicate to... Uh, I know there's going to be people who argue with me on this, and I'm happy to have the argument, but like, I don't see poisoning as going to be that big a deal on the large production models. If you have a small model and you have curated for a single thing, then poisoning could be a case. But then like, you've got to figure out why you're doing the poisoning versus just trying something that's cheaper and simpler. Anyway. So, um, like, that's all history of stuff because people have been talking about poisoning virus total for a while, and like, people have been talking about like a bunch of, like, you know, the history of this. Like, the if you learned about all this stuff on your job, a lot of the stuff I talked about is something that if you worked in machine learning security, like building a malware model or spam model or something like that for the last 20 years, you would learn about all that stuff on the job. Um, and then you just don't talk about that to the public. We have people talking about that at AI Village a lot. Um, so that's how I learned that it's a very common thing. And a lot of we would have shop talk about these things. But it's not, there aren't any books that tell you how to do this. There aren't any, the papers for the AI security stuff are mostly written by academics who haven't worked in the industry and don't think about the threat model like the professionals do. Uh, and so, like, it is different. So, um, like, that's the, one of the biggest problems with the industry is it's it, the, the, the people who really know how to do the security stuff aren't talking about it. So now, since, with, since LLMs, we have a bunch of people who've never done this. And now they're talking about it. And they think they know what they're talking about because they read a paper from someone from MIT who also thought he knew what he was talking about. Um, and did excellent academic research, and I, but not very good, uh, like actually securing machine learning models. Um, so, to give a kind of a recap to help you understand how things are going, I've come up with a like a Gartner diagram. So, I'm going to throw darts at the board, and these darts are not going to mean much, but I'm hoping that it kind of explains some of these ideas. So. First axis of like AI security is how many attackers you've got, uh, and you can lower this by having verified attacks, API limits, and being less popular. So if you just, yeah, and I'm guessing your CEO would doesn't want you to doesn't want to be less popular, but you want to be low with fewer attackers coming at you, and so the only two you can really do is make sure that you only have you can only respond to queries to verified stuff. Some of those is impossible to. The last, the second axis is like how much attack, attacker control has over your model. Uh, the way you manage that is you pick harder to manipulate features, uh, less public information, and a moving target. Uh, and so you can reduce the attacker control by moving inward. And then you have your contour lines where these are the equality things. So you're going to have a bad security system where you have to deploy each week, a good one where you only have to deploy each year, and then you know the medium ones. Um, and so you really want to think about like where do I belong on this graph? Like how much control do my attackers have over my model? How much control do I? How many attackers do I have to deal with? So here's some of my Gartner darts. Um, so we have modern spam up here. They have to redeploy every seven, three, seven days to like manage things. Especially on large social media sites, they have to redeploy aggressively because there's so many people just coming out of that. But they have, uh, because they do a lot of behavioral data, 
uh, it's really hard for spammers to change their behavior to spam less because by spamming less, they're making less money. So they want to really push that marker to like get as much content on your site as possible. So doing stuff with behavior makes is is sort of hard for them to actually control but they can they, they they have ways around it and they do find new stuff so you are redeploying like every few days because there's there's so many different ways to do this um we have malware models um it's there's the there's far fewer people who can write good malware than can write a piece of spam for a social media site so you kind of like way down there on a thing but the attackers have way more control over your system so because they get to write how what the what the executable actually works like and then you have self-driving cars um it's actually really important hard to set up an attack for self-driving cars um if you really really think about it there's these stickers don't work all that well they they do work um uh and then if you actually think about it like what's the point of stickers and stuff so i'm happy to argue with you about the self-driving car location on this thing but Going back to the Silence example, uh, they screwed up. They have introduced a machine learning vulnerability in that they made it too easy for people to manipulate them and basically just moved left on this thing. Uh, so it was a vulnerability in how much um, uh, control they gave the people. They didn't need to give it to them. Uh, and I would, to add to this prompt injectors, they probably go here. They have you have way more control over what the input to an LLM is. Uh, there's there's people who are researching this and trying to change this, um, but you have more control than before. Uh, but honestly, how many surface attack surfaces where prompt injection will actually achieve a goal to get past a security control? Like most people don't deal, you know, I'll have more slides at the end, but uh, the, how many actual like prompt injections are, will cause a system to act, send an email or do something bad. We have theorized about this, but uh, I hope there's not many people who have actually deployed control uh, systems where an LLM has bad, can do bad things. Uh, I know things. So mature teams uh, can't control how popular the service is. They can, and better features are too expensive uh, to, or impossible. When you first deploy your first like machine learning model in the wild, you're going to be like out here. Uh, you're probably going to be over here because you're giving way too many control. You haven't got a good security posture. Um, as you get more popular, you're going to go up. But as you mature, you should be uh, figuring out better features, better controls, and going inwards. Um, there's some machine learning systems like that you're not going to really be able to go inwards, but hopefully you can kind of deal with stuff. But you are hopefully moving as close as you want to move to uh, get as close here as possible. Mature teams will be as close to the uh, the, cent the uh, origin of this graph as possible. And they can't get closer without spending too much money or telling their CEO that, the, that their service has to grow less, which is not going to go over well. So they eventually they've kind of gotten the model to the point where it is as good as it's going to get the bypasses are just coming in and they don't have to deal with it and then they stop dealing with making the model more secure and they start dealing with how to make respond faster so that gets back to the quote from the facebook guy um we measure us on the speed we can respond to new kinds of attacks and de minim minimize the damage of control that's really it when, but what changed with Transformers? We kind of had a bit new access. Uh, so three-dimensional Gartner graphs work worse than two-dimensional ones because it's very hard to visualize that on a slide. And the point of this slide, this thing is to have slides for uh, your consultants to sell you things. Um, so we have this like new access. Um, but there are new threats. GPT-4's uh, paper, harmful content, they have a long list of things, uh, harms of representation, disinformation, influence operations, uh, privacy, cybersecurity. Uh, and what they did was they, in their paper, they showed a bunch of examples of how they mitigated some of these things. Um, Anthropic have released a paper shortly off, um, after 
uh, AI um, in, in November of 2022 that had this graph of different ways of people, uh, red teamers were successful or not successful in red teaming their models. And here's the different attempts that their red teaming team of 111 did. And they're all just like trying to get it to do bad things. And this is like early days of red teaming a model. Like if you were making a malware model, you would get a bunch of reverse engineers or people who understand how malware works to red team your model just to figure out where, where holes are. You do early days. This is like this this type of red teaming is like the first thing you do to figure out where and what where you need to patch what change you need to change. But like uh, generative red team one, we did the same thing. Also did one off examples. Uh, we had eight different models. Uh, we had twenty one challenges, including credit card mis economic misinformation. Um, the credit card one was get the model to tell you what the hidden credit card number is, um, and this is related to a CVE, that, a CWE that got released a few uh, a couple weeks ago. And um, in a real system, the LLM would not have access to any other credit card than your own. So you getting it, you're getting the LLM to leak your credit card information to yourself is kind of pointless. If you actually were, if a bank was to actually deploy this, they would not train them LLM on credit cards. The pre-prompt would not have the LLM would not have access to anything other than your own stuff. And this is how the uh, like recommendations from like Gavin Klondike, who's on the iOS bot top top 10, uh, the actual recommendations in uh, the CWE is recommending this. Um, running, calling this pr uh, prompt injection is like calling an SQL database uh, injection a database vulnerability, where it's mostly, it's a vulnerability in the surrounding system. And the other one, get the model to produce false information about an economic event or a fact where the false information has the potential of changing politically. This is one of the big threat models that OpenAI really freaked out about when they, were, they said, we uh, we can't release GPT-2 because it has, in, just in 2018 they were, or 2019, they were get, drumming up a lot of press saying it's too dangerous to release GPT-2 because of the damage it could cause to society. Uh, this is one of the things they kept bringing up is the amount of disinformation range, things that the, the model could do. Um, so, but the thing is like, cool, so you can make it hallucinate, if, like in modern system things, uh, what's the harm? Uh, at the same time, like large disinformation operations are up running, hiring people at the cheap to run these things. Uh, I can also download Mixdraw 7 billion and just run this on my local hardware without dealing with your LLM or like your service um, and I can uh, without violating your terms of service. Uh, so like the first bunch of those harmful content, like uh, I can just, I can also make harmful content with like cheap uh, people online. It's a bad, uh, your chat GPT making harmful content is more of a brand problem for open AI than an actual security problem. Not, um, but it's it's bad. We shouldn't do it. But like, there's way. Like, if you actually want to do this, um, uh, you want to do some things. Um, one of the things that people uh, talk about is like, oh, it's going to help you write spam and phishing emails. But like, you can just take an LSTM, like my friend John Seymour did in 2017, uh, 2017 uh, and train it on your Twitter data, and that rate makes excellent phishing spam that too many people clicked on. Uh, and that was with a dumb model. You don't need the latest LLMs to do that. Um, but there's two things that people are like really kind of worried about, like cybersecurity, because you're here at a security conference, potential for emergent risky behaviors. Uh, so security controls, uh, they're actually kind of bad at writing malware. Um, as far as uh, my friends and I can tell, uh, this might change, um, but the fact that it doesn't really know, learn it, but just does good remixing, means that it's it thing. This might change with the next version of GPT. It does help you be more productive, so people, you might get more malware um, out there in the system. But not, I, 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 this. I'm not so. I'm not as concerned about this personally, but I'm happy to be argued with. Uh, text to image models. This is one of those emergent behaviors that the creators didn't think about, but is and it's kind of good for good reason because human, most humans don't think about this as a threat. But this is really kind of the problem that we have with these large these systems is suddenly they can do something weird that we didn't think about, and there's a problem. So, CSAM image text to image generation. Uh, 
could have been generating CSAM um, from in stable, diffu uh, stable diffusion. I know they did a lot of effort in cleaning things out, but one of the data sets that were, a lot of these models were trained on, Lao and 5 billions, had 1,600 CSAM images in it, which meant those models were probably capable of generating CSAM. A model that's capable of generating porn is probably and understands the concept of children. This is one of those emergent behaviors that I didn't have to think about when I was doing malware stuff. But what actually, what if you want to sit down and solve this problem, you can turn it into, and what people did with prompt have done with prompt addictions is they turned it into a classification problem, and then they started playing the game that we've been playing for the last twenty years. So you'd have a semantic classifier, and you would see if the person is requesting it with layers of security, like keywords looking for look, uh, bad stuff that you don't want them to request. And you start doing, playing that game. But like this is one of those problems that is kind of emergent. Uh, and we uh, see it happening. But the solution for this isn't generate a whole bunch of new stuff, but it's kind of play the game we've been playing for the last 20 years. It's make a classifier, get into the, the groove of deploying it and maintaining it, and don't freak out. We've kind of been dealing with this, this sort of thing for a while. Um, and continue without things. Anyway, thank you very much.